Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Emergency neuroradiology, and I've broken these into a collection of emergency cases and a collection of trauma cases. So we'll be looking at 48 neuro cases. These are all non-contrast head CTs. So I tried to run the whole gamut here. This is one from my old days in private practice. There's a spot of intracranial gas here. I will tell you, I almost missed. Um, but yeah, there was a moment when all of a sudden I spotted it and then started to put it all together and you know, started to truly sweat because look at this, it's a little subtle, but there is definitely not only a left frontal extra axial hypodense fluid collection, but there's a bit of a level right there with a layering density suggesting some infectious debris or hemorrhage. And that's in fact what this was. It was an infectious, uh, a subdural empyema. And it had all begun with an otitis media and mastoiditis. You can see there is that left frontal fluid collection. It's present on almost every cut, but all the same, it's fairly subtle. Let's let that play one more time. There is the intracranial gas right out on the edge, right up against the pneumatized temporal bone. I'm okay with almost missing it. And there again, the left frontal extraaxial fluid collection and layering density. So that was the subdural abscess. And here, of course, is the bone window where you can see there's mastoid fluid and possibly even some erosion of the anterior aspect of the petrus. Has to be a source for that gas after all. You can see all the air spaces are pretty well socked in there. So that's a mastoiditis with subsequent subdural empyema or abscess. One of my favorites, this one is a twofer. This is a case of septic embolization. This patient, of course, was an IV drug user with endocarditis. So there was a cardiac source which helps to explain a lot of the findings you'll see. There is a hyperdense MCA, which, you know, in cases of endocarditis, I just don't think you can count on seeing embolic debris. I don't think you can count on seeing uh, vegetation on a valve. I mean, those are pretty unusual things, actually, to get a chance to spot. And uh, we'll see a few instances of those uh, here today. So higher up, this is the thing I find so fascinating about this. Uh, study, and I think you're all appreciating it now, right? On one side, there is cytotoxic edema. That extends all the way to the edge. There's a loss of gray-white differentiation. It's on the side with the hyperdense MCA. So that is an infarct. But look at the other side, the left frontal region. That's vasogenic edema. Uh, it respects the cortex, right? And it's, uh, it's much different in appearance and distribution. So this is an incredible case where a patient with uh, endocarditis actually threw a vegetative matter clot to the right MCA and suffered an infarct. Whereas in the left frontal region, you can see that central hypodensity, can't you? That is a forming abscess. So that was a hematogenously spread abscess in the left frontal region. So in the right, it's an infarct from infectious debris. On the left, hematogenously spread abscess there in the white matter causing vasogenic edema.
So hopefully at this point in your training, you're not having any difficulty separating those two out, but I, uh, I hope if there were one or two of you out there, this fixes it for you. <laughs> All right, so that's a case of septic emboli. Our next one is a granulomatous meningitis, the skull base type of meningitis that causes uh, hydrocephalus. You can see here there's thickening throughout all the meninges. Uh, the sulci are effaced or eradicated. The perimesencephalic cisterns are, uh, are essentially effaced or filled with this debris. And there's clear dilation. You can see the inferior horns, always a great indicator of hydrocephalus, as well as that third ventricle dilated here centrally. And then look at those cisterns. The perimesencephalic cisterns are all nodular, increased density, and essentially faced. Here's more of that sulcal nodularity, meningeal density, going higher up even. And again, the hydrocephalus. So here is that busy cistern with all that density coating basically all the brainstem and lower structures and then more meningeal densities as we go up higher as well just a great view right there so that's a classic granulomatous meningitis and this was tuberculosis in an hiv patient Our next one, this is an HSV encephalitis. Of course, you all know it's gonna hit the medial temporal region and uncus. Very nice demonstration of it on a, a non-contrast CT of the head. You're not gonna see this every time, but we've got a nice uh, thin section scan here that shows that hypodensity. And we even have a coronal reformat, which is of course the best way to see this. Uh, we'll talk about coronal reformats on a few of these. I am a big believer, you know, I, I shouldn't even have to mention it to tell you the truth. It just shows how far back I date, right? We all went off of axial images uh, and I always thought it ridiculous. The coronal is so helpful on head CTs. Uh, it is now standard, sagittal coronal axial on every head CT. And that's what we request of all our client facilities as well. And here it is. On the coronal, you can just see how full it is, the asymmetry, the medial encroachment of that uncus. And this is a very important call to make. That is potentially life-threatening, needs immediate treatment. As our old infectious disease attending said once about herpetic encephalitis, if any of us got this, we'd be getting a new job. Right. Nobody uh, truly s survives a well-seated infection like this without some uh, residual deficit. All right, our next one. This is multiple regions of vasogenic edema. Nice depiction of the fact that sometimes you can and sometimes you can't actually see the lesion uh, that's inciting all that inflammation. It's funny, I'll tell you from my days as an internist, we thought a ring enhancing lesion was diagnostic of toxo. That's how funny is that? Uh, that's just how frequently that phrase was tossed around in that particular setting. So uh, do be careful of telling people he's got ring enhancing lesions. Uh, just give them the full differential. You never know what, uh, what kind of associations any given clinician is going to make off of uh, just a description of a finding. So you can see there in the thalamus, there in the right putamen, there are lesions all over. In fact, the more you look, the more you'll see. So that is toxoplasmosis on a non-con head CT. It's one we see all the time in Tucson. Um, you know, as much as all of us curse the FDA, uh, they uh, they do do a good job of keeping our food supply clean. And this is uh, something we see very frequently 
in uh, people who were raised in Mexico and uh, crossed the border to Tucson. Uh, they carry with them, even if it was decades ago, they will carry with them a potential infection. Usually we just see these calcified, but every once in a while you'll find some live ones. And every once in a while, even more rarely, you'll actually see these hypodense collections with a, a worm scolex visible within it, which I think you can see there in that left frontal. Here, all over the place, you can actually see the worm uh, within his little uh, fluid cocoon there. So here's the video on that one. I like the right paramesencephalic region on here too. There's one hiding uh, right there on the right. So that one defied annotation. There were just too many to bother pointing any one out. So that's acute cystocercosis infection. Impressive how little edema those cause. A nice uh, symbiotic relationship, huh? Okay, a uh, great case of a very impressive non-con head CT finding. There are multiple hypodense lesions uh, throughout the white matter. In fact, some that are clear, defined fluid collections consistent with parenchymal abscesses. But the thing I want everyone to spot here is the thickened, prominent, and hyperdense ependema. That is something you will not see every day, and that is indicative of infectious ventriculitis. So we've got a lot of fluid collections. Certainly this is a pretty widespread infection. But again, that yellow circle, that's the key finding. That's ventriculitis that puts this on a whole other level. So we'll let that play one more time through. And there it is, that thickened dependema. Pretty impressive. All right, so that was a chemotherapy patient who had a nocardial infection with ventriculitis. Our last one. Well, this is a pretty unusual disease, but uh, you know we we do get studies from all around the country, 1,600 facilities. Uh, we read a about six and a half million studies every year. So even the stuff that's incredibly rare uh, comes across your desk uh, with, with disturbing frequency. So you can see all these small little hypodensities all scattered throughout the putamina on either side, right? Kind of nonspecific, but then if you go look this up, you're not gonna find a whole lot of things that will do this. Uh, this patient was actually uh, presented with a rapid onset dementia over the course of just about six weeks. And these combinations of findings are actually enough to suspect that this is a spongiform encephalopathy. And ultimately, it is uh, a brain slicing is required for this definitive diagnosis, and that was performed here. This was believed to be of cow origin, the mad cow spongiform encephalopathy. There are uh, familial forms of this as well, and uh, other disease types like Kruzfeld Jakob and uh, Scrapie, which affects sheep. But this one was, in fact, mad cow disease.